Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. 
Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Hare Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama.
Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama. This is chapter four, text ten. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Vita Raghavaya Krodha Manmaya Mamupashrita Bahovo Jnana Tapasa Puta Madhbhava Magata Translation Being freed from attachment, fear, and anger, being fully absorbed in me, and taking refuge in me. Many, many persons in the past became purified by knowledge of me, and thus they all attained transcendental love for me. 
purport. As described above, it is very difficult for a person who is too materially affected to understand the personal nature of the Supreme Absolute Truth. Generally, people who are attached to the bodily conception of life are so absorbed in materialism that it is almost impossible possible for them to understand how the Supreme can be a person. Such materialists cannot even imagine that there is a transcendental body which is imperishable, full of knowledge and eternally blissful. In the materialistic concept, the body is perishable, full of ignorance and completely miserable. Therefore, people in general keep this same bodily idea in mind when they are informed of the personal form of the Lord. For such materialistic men, the form of the gigantic material manifestation is supreme. Consequently, they consider the supreme to be impersonal. And because they are too materially absorbed, the conception of retaining the personality after liberation, fright from ma- after liberation from matter, frightens them. When they are informed that spiritual life is also individual and personal, they become afraid of becoming persons again. And so they naturally prefer a kind of merging into the impersonal void. Generally, they compare the living entities to the bubbles of the ocean, which merge into the ocean. That is the highest perfection of spiritual existence attainable without individual personality. This is a kind of fearful stage of life devoid of perfect knowledge of spiritual existence. Furthermore, there are many persons who cannot understand spiritual existence at all, being embarrassed by so many theories and by contradictions of various types of philosophical speculation, they become disgusted or angry and foolishly conclude that there is no supreme cause and that everything is ultimately void. Such people are in a diseased condition of life. Some people are too materially attached. Some people are too materially attached and therefore do not give attention to spiritual life. Some of them want to merge into the supreme spiritual cause, and some of them disbelieve in everything, being angry at all sorts of spiritual speculation out of hopelessness. This last class of men take to the shelter, to the take to the shelter of some kind of intoxication, and their <clears throat> Effective hallucinations are sometimes accepted as spiritual vision. One has to get rid of all three stages of material consciousness, attachment to material life, fear of a spiritual personal identity, and the conception of void that arises from frustration in life. To get free from these three stages of the material concept of life, one has to take complete shelter of the Lord, guided by a bona fide spiritual master, and follow the disciplines and regular principles of devotional life. The last stage of the devotional life is called bhava, or transcendental love of Godhead. There's more to this purport. I think I'm going to stop here for now and speak a little bit about what we've read. Om Jnana Timarandasya Gyananjana Salakaya Chakshu Om Nini Tamni Natazmai Shri Gurave Namaha Mukam Koroti Vachalam Pangum Nangayate Garim Yakipa Tamaham Vande Shri Gunundi Nataranam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Mati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namane Namaste Saraswate Devi Gauravani Pracharane Nirvishesha Shanyavadi Pastachade Satarane 
Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaiti Gadar Har Shri Vasari Gaura Bhaktivinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare This verse follows the previous verse where Krishna says, Janmakama, well known verse of Bhagavad Gita, Janmakama Chame Devyam even Yo Veti Tattvata. Then anyone who knows the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities in this world does not, upon leaving the body, take his birth again in the material world, but attains my eternal abode. In other words, that verse describes the qualification for entering into the eternal abode, which is considered to be the supreme param dham, the supreme destination for all living beings. The state of existence whereby the living entity realizes his eternal relationship with the supreme and by realize, having realized that eternal relationship with the Supreme, the Lord reciprocates <coughs> in such a loving way due to the living entity's loving service. The Lord reciprocates in such a loving way that the devotee feels full satisfaction completely due to that loving reciprocal relationship between the living entity and the Lord. That's why Prabhupada concludes this by saying that the, the, the last stage of devotional life is called bhava, or transcendental love of Godhead. <clears throat> it is the last stage because it is the supreme shelter of the living being. In the beginning of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna specifically places a lot of emphasis about the nature of the soul, the eternality of the soul, and the individuality of the soul. In the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Na tvevaham jatam nasam, na tvam nemi janadi pa. He says, never was there a time when you, I did not exist, Arjuna. Never was there a time when you did not exist, Arjuna. Nor never was there a time when all these assembled kings in the battlefield that you are personally observing right now did not exist, nor in the future will any of you cease to be. <clears throat> in that statement, Krishna establishes the individuality and the eternality, not only of the soul, which is Arjuna, to whom he's speaking, which is all the kings who are assembled uh, in that battlefield, and there were millions of them, and he's also speaking of himself. And therefore, he clearly states that our individuality always existed in the past, exists now, and will continue to exist in the future. By making this statement, Krishna is making it very clear that the identity of the soul, or the eternal, eternal, eternal nature of the soul, which has no beginning and has no end, uh, is of a similar nature to his nature, where it's described in the Brahma Samhita, where the Lord has no beginning, he has no end, he has no material body. Uh, he is a, uh, <clears throat> his body is not subject to decay. He is the beginning, the origin of everything. Uh, so why does Krishna explain that point, the very basic philosophical principle to Arjuna in the beginning is, is to help him to understand that you are always going to exist. And if you want to be in that, uh, in a fully realized state, if you want to actually uh, fully understand me, you can only understand me when there's reciprocation or loving reciprocation. You exist, I exist. Krishna, doesn't, uh, Krishna didn't say, never was there a time, Arjuna, 
when I did not exist, nor in the future will I cease to be. If, if, if Krishna had made such a statement, then one would think that, well, then that means we're all non-different from Krishna. But he clearly made a distinction between you and the kings and himself to state that the individuality of the soul also continues to exist. That means upon the demise of the temporary physical body, the individuality of the soul continues. And therefore, Srila Prabhupada very interestingly describes in this verse what attachment, fear, and anger is. He says one has to become freed from attachment, fear, and anger, uh, which is the stage of material conditioning. He says that that fear is, the, as he says right here, it's just very interesting. I just was noticing that as I was reading here. He says that this is a kind of fearful stage of life. Oh, no, that's not what I was looking for. Yes, he... And because they are too materially absorbed, the conception of retaining the personality after liberation from matter frightens them. <clears throat> Prabhupada is emphasizing again and again what is this fear uh, that Krishna is talking about that one has to become freed from. It's that fear of, of the... Uh, Prabhupada also explains elsewhere in Bhagavad Gita that fear comes from uncertainty of one's future. Mm -hmm. If one is not knowing what is one's future, is he lives in constant fear. What will happen today? What will happen later today? What will happen tomorrow? You know, what's going to happen when I get old? What's going to be happen if I get diseased? Uh, and then, of course, it comes to the point which the greatest fear is at the time of death, what's going to happen when I die? What does happen? <clears throat> and uh, therefore, because of that uncertainty, nobody wants to die. <laughs> nobody is willing to, to embrace death as, oh yes, this is, uh, this is uh, going to be the happiest day of my life. <clears throat> Although sometimes people who are, who are victims of an impersonal conception, they may think, yes, death will be, make me very happy because at least it will be an end to all the suffering and the frustration I'm experiencing now. Such persons who think this way actually do not understand the eternality of the soul because they do not realize that, as Krishna says right in the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Dehi no spinyata dehi kumaram jovanam jarata tate as the embodied soul continually passes in this life from boyhood to youth to old age, the soul similarly passes into another body at death. Dira statra namuyati, one who's dira, one who's self-realized, he's not bewildered by that change. Because he knows that death simply means, and Krishna goes on to explain, just as a person takes off old clothes from the, and he puts on new clothes, the soul simply takes off his present physical body and takes on another body at the time of death. Nobody is fearful of changing their clothes. So similarly, for one who is dira, one who is self-realized, he's not fearful of changing his body as long as he knows who he is. If he doesn't know who he is, then he has to live in fear. What will be my next destination? What will happen? And Krishna, of course, throughout Bhagavad Gita gives many different descriptions and analysis of what destination is for the living entities according to their particular attachments in life. He says, as the living entity, uh, uh, as uh, the living entity carries his different conceptions of life from one body to the next, this is a soul, uh, 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 just as a flower carries a fragrance of, of uh, uh, it's from uh, the wind carries the fragrance of a flower from one place to the next. So, in the same way, the living entity, who is still attached to the bodily conception of life, the living entity who is looking simply for relief from his suffering the living entity who is thinking about how to enjoy life and is very, very anxious that death means the termination of all my plans in life, all the things I wanted to fulfill in life, then his different conceptions of life will be carried from one body into the next body according to the attachments that he has. So therefore Krishna says that one has to become free from attachment. <clears throat> 
Become free from attachment, means attachment to the bodily conception of life. Become free from fear, which is, as we explained before, the fear of uh, the conception of retaining personality after liberation from matter frightens them. They think that, that if, as soon as they hear, I'm eternal, and if I've lived such a life as I've lived this in this life, as, as a person who's undergone so much anxiety, distress, and suffering, and you're going to tell me I have to live like this forever? Oh, that's a fearful, that's a fearful thought. It's a fearful thought to hear that we're eternal, and if we don't have a conception of what eternality means, we'll think, I have to live like this forever? That means I'm going to have to suffer forever. Because they don't understand what Krishna says in the previous verse, John Makama Chame Divyam Ivan Yoveti Tatvata, he understands that if you simply understand the transcendental nature of my appearance and activities in this world, if you know that I have no birth, and my activities are all completely transcendental, do you know that, that you have no birth and the activities that you're engaging in this life are simply temporary activities due to the identification of the body in this life? And if you know that at the time of death, your individuality is, is retained, not by having to accept another material body, another place of material suffering, but your individuality is, is retained because you and I have a relationship. <laughs> and because you and I have a relationship, which of course is what Krishna is alluding, or what Prabhupada is alluding to, is the loving relationship, that loving relationship is, is so satisfying to the soul that the soul doesn't even think of his own happiness. Imagine. Imagine not to think of your own happiness. I mean, our conditioned state of existence is just to make plans to project how well I will be happy in the future. Sometimes we make plans for happiness for the day. Sometimes we make plans for happiness next week. Sometimes we make plans for happiness in the future. And generally, the happiness that we make plans for is the relief of our current distress. We think, yes, when I get the opportunity to do that, I won't have to be doing what I'm doing now. I'll be happy. That's their conception of happiness. But actually, the devotees who have understood their eternal relationship with the Lord, they don't even think of their own happiness. Why? Bhajaniya paramasuka matra sasukadva. The transcendental relationship that exists between the Supreme Lord and his devotee is such that the devotee is so satisfied by having realized that I'm simply, my purpose in life is to give Krishna pleasure because Krishna is a person. When people hear this, Sometimes it's very, very difficult because they've been so conditioned into thinking about their own happiness that they can't let go of that conception. They can't let go of the fear, they can't let go of the attachment, and they can't let go of the anger, the frustration that they've experienced in their life. They can't let go because they have no conception of God as a person because the only thing they've been able to think throughout their whole life is their own pleasures. And to make plans for their own pleasure, either Selfish pleasure or extended selfish, extended selfishness through giving pleasure to, to family, giving pleasure to society, giving pleasure to, uh, to the, uh, other living entities. But actually, the fully satisfying existence of the living entity, which Krishna states elsewhere in this verse and in many places of the Bhagavad Gita, is by serving him as a person. Krishna becomes so pleased by that service that, and because he's a person, and because he's a person, he has desires, and because he has desires, he has senses, but his senses are not like our senses. His senses are transcendental. His senses, our senses, they become satisfied by coming in contact with the objects of senses. And the, sense, and the satisfaction we get by coming in talk, contact with the objects of the senses gives very temporary pleasure. But Krishna's senses are not of senses of that nature. Krishna has spiritual senses, and because they're spiritual senses, 
then to satisfy Krishna's senses does not require something physical, something material. Krishna's senses are satisfied by a desire to please him. Krishna's senses are satisfied by, uh, by only by spiritual activities. As we said before, bhajaniya parama sukha makrasa that verse we didn't translate means, to the degree that Krishna's senses are pleased, our senses become pleased. To the degree that Krishna is satisfied, but what satisfies Krishna? Krishna is not satisfied by some material offering. He's not satisfied by some uh, uh, mercantile exchange. He's not satisfied to th by those who simply approach him for something. This is selfish. He's satisfied by those who approach him with love. Bhagavan, when we think of Bhagavan, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha, Bhagavan means he possesses all opulences of full. He's the most wealthy, he's the most intelligent, he's the most beautiful, he's the most strong, he's the most renounced. <clears throat> These are his qualities as Bhagavan. And therefore, sometimes we think that if we hear about God, God is the supreme controller, so he's the supreme proprietor, he's the supreme enjoyer, then therefore we think that, yes, I should approach God and ask him for something for myself. But just like a, we oftentimes give the example, just like a wealthy man, if a man is very wealthy, has so much opulence, it's very difficult to know who actually likes him, who's his friend. Because he thinks, why is somebody approaching me? Does he want my money? Does he want something from me? So Krishna's the same way. He's Bhagavan. But he has, there's a higher conception of God, which he's much more satisfied in living eternally with his eternal associates. And that higher conception of God is not as God is the, as, the, as, the, as the provider, God is the maintainer, God is the, as the person who provides all the, uh, the ingredients for material sacrifice in the material world. This is one conception of God, but it is only a partial conception of God. The higher conception of God is God who is the person and who has desires, who has senses, who has qualities, and who has relationships with everyone. Aham bija pita pita, Krishna says, I am the seed giving father of all living beings. That means he has a relationship with us. Not only that, but he wants that relationship with us. But he asks, if you want to have a relationship with me, then all I ask is you learn to love me. <laughs> if you learn to love me, it means you learn how to think of his pleasure. Instead of thinking about how will I get something from him, how will I get some satisfaction for myself, how will I get some relief from my distress, how how can I please him? He's a person. But because people are too conditioned by the materialistic conception of life, as Prabhupada explains, it is very difficult for them to conceive that God is a person. He has a spiritual body. He has spiritual senses. He has desires. And not only does he have all of those, but he's eternal. And we're eternal. And not only that, but we exist because he wants to give pleasure to us. <laughs> he wants to give, be, because he's so self-satisfied, he wants to give pleasure to all living beings. But for those who have selfish desires, then the next verse, Krishna explains, for those who have selfish desires, As you surrender unto me, I'll reward you accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects, O son of Prita. For those who have selfish desires, if you surrender to me, you want liberation. If you surrender to me by thinking me as the supreme controller, the supreme proprietor, and the, and the supreme object, then I will reciprocate. I'll give you that which you want, but you won't get Krishna, and you won't experience love for Krishna. And not only that, everything that you get will be temporary. And it cannot satisfy the self. Nothing temporary can satisfy the self. So, therefore, Krishna is stating in this verse, and Prabhupada is, is 
making it very, very clear, we try to sp touch a little bit upon these points that Prabhupada speaks about, specifically about fear. The fear of the, of the personality after liberation, it, it frightens people, retaining this personality. This personality means, yes, this conditioned personality, but what about a different personality, which is my natural constitutional nature? My constitutional nature, as Prabhupada explains again and again, that the constitutional nature is jivira sudu poya krishtarana nichidas. The constitutional nature of the living entity is that he's a servant of Krishna. But uh, in order to realize that, that relationship with Krishna as a servant, one has to first learn how to practice pleasing Krishna. Prabhupada, once on a morning walk, he was discussing this topic with his disciples, and he was asking the question of what is the symptom of love? And devotees were giving different answers according to what they thought was a philosophical understanding of love. Love is, is reciprocal. Love, is, love means no, no selfish desires. Love means to please the beloved. And these were all good answers. But Prabhupada heard, heard all their answers, and he said, yes, but he wanted something else. And he stopped, and he put his cane down, and he said, love means first you must be obedient. <laughs> Before you can love God, you have to be obedient. Otherwise, how can you love? And he made this point very clear that obedience, of course, even when we read Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, the nectar devotion, which describes the different stages of love, and Prabhupada explains it in relationship with the spiritual master. The first stage is obedience, because without obedience, one can never come to the platform of love. I mean, so many times Prabhupada emphasized that with his disciples. Sometimes the devotees would ask Srila Prabhupada a question. Like, Srila Prabhupada, it's very difficult to follow the regular principles. How, should I, how can I follow the regular principles? And Prabhupada said, the instructions of the spiritual master should be sufficient. <laughs> Obedience. <laughs> that was his answer. He didn't get into anything, <laughs> anything about a, a, a long philosophical explanation. Instructions of the spiritual master should be sufficient. <laughs> because the first stage of love is, is obedience. So if we want to learn to love, then Srila Prabhupada gave so many different instructions, not only about following the regulative principles, which he goes on to describe in today's purport, but also he goes on to explain in various stages about how that one should serve uh, uh, the Supreme Lord, serve the, the deity of the Lord, serve the Vaishnavas of the Lord, uh, try to please them with a heart, which means loving reciprocal relationships, which means that we don't do it for selfish purposes, but actually a real loving reciprocal relationship is that when we offer something to the, to the Lord with love, that means we're not thinking of something in return. If this is not cultivated, then people will go on having to experience attachment, fear, and anger, because they'll stay on the bodily concept of life. The only way to get off, Prabhupada, Krishna says, being freed from attachment, fear, and anger, being fully absorbed in me, and taking refuge in me. <laughs> taking refuge in me, being fully absorbed means being fully absorbed in thoughts of how to please the Lord, being fully absorbed in thoughts of remembering the Lord, being fully absorbed in thoughts of how to, uh, uh, to serve the Lord. Taking refuge in me means, taking refuge means fully, fully dependent upon the Lord. That I will please the Lord, and because I'm not asking for anything in return, then let his pleasure be my satisfaction. I will take refuge in simply trying to please him. Many, many persons in the past became purified. Why? By knowledge of me. Why? Because Krishna says, as you surrender unto me, I, re I reveal myself. 
I reward you accordingly. You get knowledge, one gets knowledge by surrendering to the Lord. The Lord reciprocates and reveals himself through that process. Bhakti Pureshano Bhava Varakti on Yasha Chaisha Trika Ekakala. We oftentimes quote this verse that to the degree that one is engaged in devotional service, devotion, direct experience of the Lord, and detached from material things come simultaneously increasingly in the same way as a person who is getting experiencing pleasure, nourishment, and relief from hunger with each bite for a person who's engaged in eating. When a person eats, <laughs> he's, he's experiencing, my hunger is going away. It's direct, it's a direct experience. It's a subjective experience. He doesn't ask somebody else, am I still hungry? <laughs> he knows. He gets the direct experience of the Lord which is compared to nourishment. He gets strength. If he's been fasting all day, you take something at night and you eat and all of a sudden, oh, finally, I'm getting some strength. You don't have to ask somebody, am I feeling strong? You know. You know your hunger is going away. You know you're getting stronger. And you know when it tastes good. <laughs> Pleasure, nourishment, and relief from hunger. So in the same way, when there's devotion... Uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam says, when one's engaged in devotional service, he experiences devotion increasing. He experiences direct ex presence of the Lord. He perceives the presence of the Lord in his life. He sees, yes, Krishna is doing this to me. He's made this arrangement just to help me get out of my conditioned state of consciousness to get out from my lazy state of consciousness my selfish state of consciousness he's put me in this situation and now what will i do well i will stay in, on the platform of being attached looking becoming angry and being fearful or will i actually take shelter and refuge in him and feel reciprocation and support from him this is how one gets knowledge of him Knowledge of him is revealed. It's not academic. It's not you study every day a page of the Bhagavad Gita and all of a sudden you accumulate all your studies of each memorizes of verses and you have knowledge of Krishna. Krishna says, no, you can know me as you am, as I am, only by undivided devotional service. Only then can you enter into the mysteries of understanding me. That is how you know Krishna. Krishna reveals. Therefore, it is a cultivation of desire. Cultivation of a desire. Why am I given this opportunity? I'm given this opportunity to cultivate the desire to please the Lord through my service. That is devotional service. Otherwise, it, devotional service it does not at least come, or one does not aspire for that platform. Then there will always be attachment, fear, and anger. This is Krishna's message in this verse. It's seven o'clock. Hare Krishna. <laughs> 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 <laughs>